Good morning, church. Good morning. Good to see everyone out today. Thanking the Lord for another day to serve him and to worship together. Let's go ahead and stand together and we'll sing about his great love. Love lifted me. Hymn number 629, Love lifted me. 629. is going to open us with prayer. Amen. Let's pray together this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege it is to come and worship you again in spirit and in truth as we get a chance to fellowship with your people, as we get a chance to sing songs of praise to your name and hear your word preached. We ask that you would work in all of our hearts, Lord, prepare us for all that will be said and done. I pray that we would be ready to receive uh, just truth from your word today. I pray, Lord, that you would bring conviction of sin in our hearts and bring encouragement where needed as well. Lord, we're praying for anyone that's lost. I pray anyone that's lost, uh, here in person or watching at home that may not be saved, that the Holy Spirit would bring them to that place where they can trust in Christ alone as Savior. And Lord, we're looking forward to all of your blessings. Lord, we look forward to uh, how you're going to minister to us. Lord, we just, uh, just confess our desperate need of you today. Lord, we need your spirit to encourage us, to allow us to live for you, to serve you. We need your spirit, Lord, to minister through us as we desire to reach the lost all around us. And so, Lord, I pray that this service would have your spirit's power and effect upon our lives. And we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Our next song is going to be hymn number 590, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. Jesus came into my heart. 
joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I have ceased from my wandering and going astray. Since Jesus came into my heart, and my sins, which are many, are all washed away. Since Jesus came into today, um, but uh, you can be seated at this time. Thank you. Amen. Good singing, and uh, good morning, and welcome to you all. Thank you for being here, and we want to welcome those that are watching online on the live stream as well, and we're thankful for the chance to uh, have church together, worship together, hear the Lord's word, and uh, fellowship one with another, and we're excited for what God's going to do today in our services. Uh, tonight, we will be having the Lord's Supper, and so please be in prayer for that. Last Sunday was a blessing. We had three get baptized, and tonight having the Lord's Supper, and we're excited to continue uh, going forward with the ordinances that the Lord commanded us to perform. Um, and then also, please keep a few folks in prayer for their health needs. Pray for Sister Betty. I mentioned in the earlier service, I talked to Betty yesterday, and she's been having some health issues. She was actually in the hospital for a few days uh, but she is home now, but she was hoping to be back in church soon, but it seems like one thing after another uh, with her. Of course, many of you may remember she was in a car accident a few weeks back, uh, but she just asked for prayer, and I'm sure she can use some encouragement if you get a chance to give her a call or maybe stop by and see her. I'm sure that would mean a lot to her. But pray for Sister Betty. Pray also for Sister Comfort. Uh, she's having some tests run tomorrow, and so please keep that in your prayers and pray for healing for her. Then, of course, you may have heard over the weekend, pray for our president and his wife and all those that are affected by COVID-19. And we ought to be praying for their healing. And I believe the word of God tells us to pray for all those who are in authority. We want to make sure we live a peaceable life. That's God's will, God's plan. And so we should be praying towards that end. And so we're praying for all those that are affected by uh, the coronavirus. Um, the big prayer request I'd ask for you to put on your prayer list and begin praying and even planning 
Uh, next month, we're having our missions conference. And you know, this year with COVID-19, obviously so many plans have kind of gone out the window. I'm sure for you personally, for our church, for our ministry. But I really did pray and ask what the Lord wanted us to do. And I really feel strongly that the Lord would want us to have our missions conference. I think it's an important time to remind ourselves of our mission, our purpose as Christians and as a church. Uh, the church is not a social club. Uh, the church is here to evangelize the world. And I know we have all of our individual focuses and, and concerns. And I know with this coronavirus, there's a lot of concern. But may we never lose sight of our purpose is to get the gospel out around the world. And if we lose sight of that, we're losing sight of our purpose and who we are. And we've always been a missions-minded church here, and so we're going to move forward with our missions conference. And I'm excited to have several missionaries will be with us. And I spoke to them on the phone. It really works out. Many of them will already be in our area, and so they're going to stop by and be with us that week. But it's November 1st through November 4th. That's a Sunday through Wednesday. Our Sunday schedule will be just as it has been with our morning services split and a 6.30 p.m. service. But then Monday through Wednesday will be 7.30 p.m. So Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, 7.30 p.m. So pray for the conference and do your best to attend. I know God will speak to your heart. I know God will work and encourage you. We get a chance to hear from what God is doing around the world and how God is using some of these missionaries. We have two missionaries going to different countries in Africa and one missionary going to the Philippines. Uh, some of you may remember Brother J.B. Tarwater. He was here right after the uh, Hurricane Sandy, so I think that was 2012. And he was here helping out and doing a lot here, and God's called him to be a missionary, and so it's going to be a good chance to see him again and fellowship with him and his new wife. He's married now, and a few other missionaries. And our special speaker, Brother Samuel Esquivel, missionary to the Jews, and right now ministering in Mexico. And he's going to come and challenge our hearts that week, and so please be in prayer for the upcoming conference. All right, that's all I have for the announcements at this time. Brother Josh is going to come and lead us in our scripture reading this morning. And I uh, want to also make an announcement, again, reminding teens and families that this Friday, I believe I had said the 8th, but it's the 9th, this Friday at 7.30 p.m., we will be having a teen activity um, in person here at the church, and um, we'll be doing a movie night. Uh, so if you show up after 7.30, you're going to miss part of the movie. So it would be in your best interest to uh, be here on time at 7.30 on Friday. So we're looking forward to, to it. We're excited to have everyone out together. And uh, we'll be praying for that as well. If you could stand together, we'll do our Bible reading this morning. Psalm 102, we started this psalm last week and we'll finish it uh, this morning. So Psalm 102, beginning with verse 14. Psalm 102, beginning with verse 14. The Bible says, For thy servants take pleasure in her stones, and favor the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth are at glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. He will work prayer of the Jews, and not their pride their prayers. This shall be written for the generation to come, and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. To hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those that are appointed to death. To declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When the people are gathered together in the kingdoms to serve the Lord. I said, O oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years are throughout all generations. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. 
The children of thy servants shall continue, and their seed shall be established before thee. Amen. You may be seated. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. I got a couple more uh, announcements and things to take care of here this morning. Uh, my wife reminded me we're planning on resuming children's church for our young people uh, starting next month as well. And so please be in prayer for that. And we want to meet with some of our workers to begin planning and preparing for that. So next uh, month, November the 9th, we'll plan on starting children's church. So you be praying for that. And then I mentioned uh, the several that were baptized um, last Tuesday, uh, last Sunday, I'm sorry. And we want to give them their baptismal certificates this morning. So first, I'm going to ask uh, Jeremiah Peters, if you please come. Brother Jeremiah was baptized September 27th, last Sunday, and uh, into the membership of Iowa Baptist Church. And we're so thankful and excited that he has taken the step of faith. Amen, brother. Thank you, Jeremiah. And then I'm also going to ask for Jonathan and Kathleen, if they would please step up and we'll give them their certificate as well. And they also were baptized last Sunday, the 27th day of September 2020, into the membership of Bible Baptist Church. And we are thankful for this young couple. Pray for them. They're both engaged to be married uh, next year, I believe. And so please keep them in your prayers. Here you go, Jonathan. I don't know if this is the correction for that. I mean, that's right. All right. Amen. So please keep this couple uh, in your prayers as they continue their journey and follow in the Lord. And so we want to also just move to vote them in officially as members of Bible Baptist Church. Uh, so all in favor, say amen. Amen. All right. Is anyone that opposes? And of course, there's none. And so congratulations, you folks. Officially welcome to the membership. And we are so thankful for what God is doing. And each of their families are just great families, excited for where God has taken them. And so please keep them in your prayers. All right. It's time for us to collect our offering. So we'll have our ushers come to the front, and we'll collect our offering for this morning. You know, I mentioned missions earlier, and we certainly want to make sure as God's people, as he meets our needs, that we're faithful to uh, obey him in this matter of our giving. We get a wonderful privilege to partner with the work of the gospel all around the world by our prayers and by our giving. And so let's make sure we keep it up, and let's pray for this morning's offering. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the privilege it is to give. Lord, thank you that we can worship you, Lord, through our singing and through uh, sharing your word, but also through the gifts that we give. We pray, Lord, that you would bless this offering, take it and use it for the furtherance of your gospel. I pray you'd help us as a church to be good stewards of the funds collected and that we would be able to accomplish more for you here locally and more for you around the world. Would you bless each gift, bless each giver, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
take our Bibles and we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And this morning, I want to preach on a very important topic. I think it will be a blessing to us. And I want to preach on the sealing of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to start here in Ephesians chapter 1, but we're going to uh, jump around a bit to a few other scriptures, so keep your Bibles handy. But we're going to be talking about being sealed by the Holy Spirit. And so let's start here in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. The Bible says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the day of redemption, the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. And let's jump over to Ephesians chapter 4. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 30. And verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And let's look at one last scripture, 2 Corinthians. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. And it's from these three passages that the Bible really uh, instructs us about this ministry of the Holy Spirit in sealing us. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. And there the Bible says, Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts? Let's stop here and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the privilege to open up and study your word. And Lord, to preach on this incredible subject of the Holy Spirit and his ministry in our lives. Lord, we pray that by your Spirit you would illumine our minds, that we would understand, but also touch our hearts, that we would obey whatever it is you show us and teach us. Lord, would you fill me and enable me to clearly explain and preach your truth, and would you work in all of our hearts for your honor and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit, I want you to understand this, the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not just some force. He's not just some nebulous uh, power that's out there somewhere. He is a person. In fact, we just read in Ephesians 4.30, he can be grieved. You can only grieve a person. And secondly, the Holy Spirit, more importantly, the Holy Spirit is God. He is God. The Bible teaches that God is a trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct beings but one, uh, three distinct persons, I'm sorry, but one being, God. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse in the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Hebrew word for God is Elohim. That's the Hebrew word for God. And the word Elohim is a plural word. So right there in the very first scripture, the Bible is teaching us there's a plurality in the Godhead. It does not teach that there are three gods, it's one God and three distinct persons. I want us to emphasize that because that's the God of the Bible. There's a lot of uh, false teaching regarding the Holy Spirit. Perhaps you've heard of men like T.D. Jakes and those of the apostolic uh, uh, faith and theology that will literally teach that uh, God the Father morphed into God the Son and God the Son has morphed into and has become God the Holy Spirit. But I want you to understand that is not biblical at all. Because the Bible teaches three distinct beings, one person. The best illustration of that, I believe, is that when Jesus Christ was baptized. You have God the Father in heaven looking down, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You have the Holy Spirit descending upon Christ as a dove. And right there, a beautiful illustration of the Trinity. So God is a Trinity. I want us to emphasize that, and now thinking about the Holy Spirit, because... I suppose this per third person of the Trinity is one of the most confused and there's so many different ideas and debates and arguments about the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've had people tell you, well, you know, you Baptists, you guys don't know about the Spirit. I've, heard, I've had charismatics accuse us of that. And I say, well, I, I, I don't know about the Spirit, but I know about the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, the Holy Spirit of the Bible, that's what I want to follow. That's what I want to be indwelt with. That's what I want to be filled with, the Holy Spirit of the Bible. Because the Holy Spirit will never contradict God's word. The Holy Spirit will never lead you contrary to God's word. He'll never tell you to do something that goes against what God has already told you in the Bible. And so we have to have that understanding. The Holy Spirit works through his word. And secondly, I will address to that on the other side, some people maybe react to what they see as excess in some of the emotionalism and, and, and quite frankly, foolishness that happens in so many circles. And so sometimes people run away from the Holy Spirit. And so you don't hear the Holy Spirit talked about in church. You don't hear messages preached on the Holy Spirit. And that's a terrible shame. Because if you know your Bibles, we can't function without the Holy Spirit. We can't do anything without the Holy Spirit of God. And so we need to understand who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit desires to do in our lives. The Bible teaches us the Holy Spirit first convicts us. He convicts us of our sin. John chapter 16, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He tells us what's right and what's wrong. He tells us the punishment for sin. That's judgment. And he tells us about our need for righteousness. A righteousness that's not our own, that comes from Christ. See, we can't ever understand that apart from the Holy Spirit. I don't care how smooth a preacher, I don't care how smooth your gospel witness is as you, as you talk to people, unless the Holy Spirit is behind the scenes working on a heart, sinners can never be converted. It's the Holy Spirit that lets us know, you know what, the Bible is right. It's the Holy Spirit that lets us know, you know what, I'm wrong. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. So he convicts us. And then we also must be willing and respond to that working in our hearts. And when we trust Christ, it's the Holy Spirit that regenerates us. What did Jesus say in John chapter 3? You must be born again. Let me tell you something. The first time you were born physically, you, had, you didn't do that. You didn't cause that to happen, did you? You didn't make yourself be born. Well, you don't make yourself be born again. You trust Christ and the Holy Spirit regenerates you. So regeneration is another wonderful aspect of the Holy Spirit where he makes us new. If you're saved this morning, I want you to understand your past, your sin, your shame. You're new in Christ because of the Holy Spirit. There's a new you. It's the real you. Because Christ has done this work for you and the Holy Spirit regenerated you. The Bible says that when we trust in Christ, we are indwelt, permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches we are also filled with the Holy Spirit. And one ministry that I want to zero in on today is we are sealed by the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. If we could think of our salvation, of the idea of building a house and moving in. When the Spirit of God creates a man anew in Christ Jesus, he creates a new temple, right? In the Old Testament, there was a temple made of hands. Now it's a temple that's not made of hands. That's us, right? The Holy Spirit makes us new. And then the Holy Spirit of God moves right in and takes full possession of who we are now that we're saved. That's the idea of being indwelt and sealed by the Holy Spirit the ministry of the Holy Spirit in indwelling us and sealing us, I want you to know that it's unique to this dispensation, this present time that we're in in the New Testament age, this church age. Because in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was active, but he did not permanently indwell every believer. And he did not seal believers in the Old Testament. Let me give you an example in Psalm 51, verse 11, when David, after he sinned with Bathsheba and he's repenting, and he asked the Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He had to pray that prayer. We don't have to pray that prayer today because the Holy Spirit permanently indwells New Testament church age believers. But in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would fill and indwell some believers, oftentimes leaders like King David and Joshua and other men, but only certain believers and only for a certain time. Right? Remember, I think of the example of, of Samson, how the Holy Spirit would come upon him, and you see the different times that that would happen. So in the Old Testament, it was not permanent. It was temporary, and it wasn't for every believer. So praise the Lord, in our dispensation, we have this ministry. I say that because sometimes we have the tendency to look back and say, man, I wish I had what Abraham 
and Isaac and Jacob had. I wish I could be like Moses or like Joshua and have what they had, when really it ought to be the other way around. Because we are so privileged and blessed that we have the Holy Spirit of God taking permanent residence inside of us to enable us. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was with believers. Now in the New Testament, he's in believers. And so we praise God for that. But he seals us. And, you know, we can understand the idea of what a seal is. A seal is used to attest to something's accuracy, to something's authenticity, to something's quality. For example, the United States Department of Agriculture will bear the USDA-approved stamp on things that it has approved of, right? And so we have legal documents that have a notary public put its stamp. Uh, you might put your signature or your initials on important documents to say that this is authentic. I approve of this. And so this was something that was universal in Bible times and even still in our times. We can understand the idea of a seal. And so the idea is that we are literally a piece of clay. That's all we are. But God has decided to put his stamp upon us. He's decided to seal us and approve of us and to identify with us. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Let's think of some other examples of being sealed in the Bible. For example, Matthew 27, verse 66. It talks about our Lord after he was crucified being put in a tomb, and that tomb was secured and sealed and with guards around it. What was the purpose of that? To lock it in, to keep it in, right? They didn't want anything to happen to that body. Of course, God had other plans, but they tried to seal the tomb. In Revelation chapter 20, the Bible talks about how God will bind Satan in the pit for a thousand years. And the Bible talks about that pit will be sealed. So he can't come out, he'll be bound. So there, the meaning is something that's locked up, shut in. In Romans chapter 4, verse 11, it talks about Abraham being circumcised as a seal and a sign of his righteousness by faith. When he was circumcised, it demonstrated that he was trusting the Lord. And so a seal is something that uh, gives us that stamp of authenticity. Abraham had authentic faith, real faith, and it was ev given evidence by him getting circumcised. A third meaning is protection. In Revelation chapter 7, the Bible talks about the 144,000 in the tribulation period. And God will have these unique servants with a sign and a seal upon their forehead. And that seal will protect them while all the awful events of the tribulation are happening. They'll have this divine protection. So this idea of a seal is throughout the scriptures. But number one, I want us to number one, zero in on the Holy Spirit seal protects us. The Holy Spirit seal protects us as Christians. The Bible talks about the fact that when we are saved, when we trust Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1. And verse 13. Ephesians 1 verse 13. In whom you also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, don't get tripped up by some of the prepositions that are used here, because what the Bible is essentially saying is when you heard the word of truth, you believed. And when you believed, you were sealed. You were given the Holy Spirit whereby you're sealed. Right. And so the Bible is teaching us at the moment of faith, at the moment of trusting in Jesus Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of you and to seal you. And so the Holy Spirit protects us from the penalty of sin. The Holy Spirit protects us from the penalty of sin, which is hell. That's God's judgment against sin. In Romans 6.23, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. What do we deserve for our sin? It's death, not just physical death, but spiritual death in hell. Hell's a real place where God pours out his wrath for all of eternity upon sinners. But when you trust Christ, you're protected from all of that because of the seal of the Holy Spirit. Sealing in the Bible is never given as a command or something for man to strive for because it's something that God does for us when we trust him. 
In other words, the Bible doesn't command us to be sealed because God already does that once you trust Christ. Now, the Bible does command us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you go to Ephesians chapter 5, let's go, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, which says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's a command. In fact, that's a continual command, ongoing command. Continue to seek that filling and enabling of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit ministry of sealing us is something he does instantly at the moment of faith in Christ. The Holy Spirit is both the agent and the seal itself, which is incredible. And think about this. If we go back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, let's think about the way our salvation works here. Paul says in verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation and the knowledge of him. And the Bible is literally teaching us here that the entire Trinity is at work when it comes to our salvation. And you know how we can know our salvation is secure? You know how we can know our salvation is settled? Because as secure as the Trinity is, which can never be broken, can never be undone, that union is as certain as our salvation is. It's secure because it's grounded in God himself. So this morning, we believe that our salvation is eternal. We don't believe you can lose your salvation. Some people say, well, you can lose your salvation. I said, listen, if it was up to you or up to me, certainly, yes, you can lose your salvation. I would lose my salvation tomorrow if it was up to me, but it's not up to me. Salvation is of the Lord. So our salvation is grounded in God himself, and because it is that way, it's secure. We have this divine protection from God. All believers are sealed. All believers are protected. Think about this. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, we, we saw the passage in 2 Corinthians, rather, 1.22, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. If you know anything about the church at Corinth, they were not a good church. Let's just be honest. The church at Corinth is not a model church that, hey, I want to be just like that church. There was, a, there was some serious sin in that church. And if, if Paul could write and tell those Christians that you're sealed, that tells us something about that ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's not depending on your performance, not depending upon what you do. It's depending upon the Lord and what he has done this ministry of being sealed by the Spirit. So we're protected from the penalty of sin, but I want you to know we're also protected from the power of sin. Jesus Christ came to save us from sin, from sin's penalty, but also from sin's power over your life. In the Christian life, we have three main enemies, the world, the devil, and our own flesh. Yes, the man or woman we look at in the mirror every single day, amen? <laughs> And we have these enemies, but we don't have to walk around thinking, man, how can I conquer these enemies? No, because of the Holy Spirit, we can have victory over these enemies. So when we got saved, we received the Holy Spirit, we're sealed by the Spirit. That excuse, the devil made me do it, God took that excuse away. Because you don't have to sin anymore. Now that you've been made new, now that you have the Holy Spirit, now that you've been sealed, you don't have to sin, you don't have to give in. To temptation because of the Spirit's power in your life. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. So we have this divine protection. But number two, the Holy Spirit's seal identifies who we are. It identifies who we are. That seal, that ministry of sealing us signifies ownership to whom we belong. You know, farmers who have, which have cattle, they will brand their cattle. Why do they do that? Well, in case some of their cattle gets lost, they can locate it and identify it, right? We have a dog at home, and our dog, when he, when he was just a puppy, uh, the vet said, hey, you can put a chip in him. And no, it's not the mark of the beast, don't worry. And uh, you can put a chip in him, and if he ever gets lost, they can locate it and identify that it's your dog and link you guys together. And so little Leo's chipped, amen? And so we, we got that done. And so you can have these things that show ownership, that show to whom we belong. And isn't it incredible that the Lord shows us that he has ownership over our lives. He takes ownership over who we are. I want you to understand how significant that is. Because God, the creator of the universe, he's God all by himself. 
He's holy. He's pure. And what are we? We're sinners. We're wicked. We're prideful. We have so much immorality and sin and, and pride in our hearts. He ought to have nothing to do with us. He ought to have nothing to do with us. But in salvation and in this ministry of sealing us, he identifies, yes, they're with me. Yes, those are my people. Yes, I identify with them and they identify with me. That's a wonderful, wonderful truth. And so we're sealed. It shows ownership. In the ancient world, that's what a seal was used for. A seal showed to whom you belong. 2 Timothy 2 verse 19 says this. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So the Lord knows those who are really his, by the way. Not, not the make-believers, but genuine believers, because of this seal of the Holy Spirit. And because we are in union with Christ, and our identity is linked to Christ, that ought to affect our entire lifestyle. Ephesians 4.30, we just read it, says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. So the Bible is letting us know that because we have this identity that we're in Christ, right? Our theme, we're rooted in Christ. That ought to impact every aspect of our lives. That means the people who we associate with, the places that we go the music that we listen to, the things that we watch on TV, the way that we dress, the, our attitudes, our hearts, our, our mindset, the way we think, all of that matters to God because of our identity in Christ. And so we've been given this seal to show who our identity is. This seal also authenticates who we are, that we're genuinely saved. We're genuinely in Christ. The seal validates and proves us to be genuine, the real deal. You know, sometimes some people ask me, do you think that person's saved? Do you think so-and-so is saved? And oftentimes it's someone that has a very poor testimony, but maybe made a profession or something like that. And you know what? It's really hard to know for sure from a human perspective, right? Because I can't see someone's heart. I can't see someone's spirit and soul, but God can. And I believe God sees that seal or lack of a seal and knows who's really saved and knows who's really lost. So what does that mean? It means you as an individual, you better make sure you're saved. Instead of worrying about a so-and-so saved, you better make sure you're in Christ. Examine yourself whether ye be in the faith, the Bible says. And so we make sure that we are authentic, that we are in Christ, that we've been born again, that we're the real deal. I remember a few years ago we were in the Philippines, my wife and me and my mother-in-law, and uh, we enjoyed being there. It was a great time, beautiful country and lovely time, lovely people. And we were in the shopping malls there. You know, if you know anything about Filipinos in the Philippines, they love the malls. I mean, I thought we had a shopping problem in the USA, but they love shopping over there. These huge malls. And so we're in one of these malls, and I see a, a, a sneaker store with a bunch of Nikes and Jordans. And, and you know, I kind of like that stuff. And so I kind of was checking out the store, and I saw the prices, the dirt cheap prices. This is so cheap. I, I might buy three or four or five. I don't know. And then uh, Pam's cousin said, you know, those are probably fake. Those are probably not real. I hate to burst your bubble, but if you look at the logos, they're not really where they're supposed to be. They're kind of blurry. They're not, they're not really authentic. Hey, if you go down to Canal Street, they might be selling you, hey, you can buy this Rolex. How much does the Rolex cost? $25. You buy the Rolex, and three days later, it stops working. That wasn't a Rolex. We used to call that a Folex, a fake Rolex. Listen, we want the real deal, don't we? The Holy Spirit of God seals us and authenticates that we are the real deal. That God sees and he validates our Christianity, our walk with him, based on what the Holy Spirit has done. I want you to see another aspect of this ministry of sealing and authenticating us. Go to John chapter 6, verse 27. John chapter 6 and verse 27. And our Lord is speaking here, and he says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. And get this, this last phrase here. For him, referring to the Son of Man, so talking about himself, for him hath God the Father sealed. What Christ is teaching is here that his ministry, 
his teaching ministry, his miracles that he performed, they gave authentication. They gave validation that he had the Father's approval. He had that stamp that he is truly the Son of God, and God the Father approves of all that he's doing. Praise the Lord that God the Father did that to authenticate and ratify Jesus' work. But you know what? The Lord does that for you and for me. Because this seal that the Holy Spirit puts on us shows God's approval for us too. The same way that God the Father approved of the Son, He approves of you and approves of me. This is another incredible truth here because, again, in our sin, and our wickedness, we don't deserve that approval. But by His grace, we're approved. Hey, the Bible says we're accepted in the Beloved. And the Christian life is not about me performing so that one day I can earn God's approval of me. So that I can earn God's acceptance and maybe one day he'll accept me. No, the Christian life is because of Jesus Christ I'm already accepted. I've already been approved. Holy Spirit seal on my life gives that authentication, that approval. And God already accepts me. And from that position I'm going to go out and serve him. From that position of accepted, of approved, I'm going to go out and obey him. There's a big difference there. We're working from God's approval. And so we rejoice that we have this identity because of the Holy Spirit. Then thirdly, quickly, the Holy Spirit seal guarantees our inheritance. Let's go to Ephesians 1. Let's go back to Ephesians 1 and verse 14. The Holy Spirit seal guarantees our inheritance. In verse 14, the Bible says, which is, it's talking about that Holy Spirit, that seal, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And if you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, it teaches us the exact same truth there. 2 Corinthians 1, 22 says, Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit, in our hearts. What the Bible is teaching is that when you trusted Christ and you got saved, there was an entire destiny that's been prepared for you. And the Holy Spirit is the down payment of that. It's the first installment of all the riches that are waiting for you and me who are in Christ. You know, the Bible promises all the riches of Christ Jesus that's waiting for us in heaven, all the glories of heaven. That's our inheritance. And how do I know I'm going to receive all that? Well, because of the Holy Spirit today. The Holy Spirit is that first installment of all that God has promised us. And the word that's being used here is the idea of a deposit. The deposit of a down payment. And we've been given the down payment for the fullness of all that God will do. The Holy Spirit's a pledge that there's more to come. There's more to come. As Christians... Someone said this, God has purchased us on the layaway plan, in a sense. And he has given us an impressive down payment. And we know he won't walk away from the final payment because he's invested so much already. He's given us himself, the Holy Spirit. The everlasting guarantee that we're saved. This is another reason why we're secure. Our, our salvation can't be lost because it's been purchased and God has given us this down payment to prove that to us, that it's, the deal is as good as done. It's an everlasting guarantee. You know, guarantees today have a lot of fine print. You go out and buy a new car, they'll tell you, well, there's a 100,000 mile guarantee. We'll fix it and repair it. And you look at the fine print, except if you make a, a left turn on a Tuesday morning at 3 o'clock, or if you do this, then you void the warranty. And you're like, wait a minute, that's not really much of a, of a guarantee, is it? No, the gospel doesn't work that way. When you got saved, you didn't make a contract with the Lord. You didn't say, hey, I'll do this and you do this and we'll just kind of work this salvation thing out. No, the gospel shows that we had nothing. We had absolutely nothing. He had everything. But by his grace, he offered us everything through Jesus Christ. And we received it by faith. And the Holy Spirit is a down payment that all of the promises are true. And there's more to come. The Holy Spirit is that that first initial payment, that earnest that God has given us, and that earnest 
burns in our hearts that God's promises are true whenever the Holy Spirit is at work. Whenever the Holy Spirit is at work giving you peace that passes understanding, may that be a reminder, Lord, there's still more to come. When the Holy Spirit gives you joy unspeakable and full of glory, you can remember, Lord, there's more to come. The Holy Spirit sanctifies you, renews your mind, and you realize, I think differently than the way I used to think. I think more biblically now. You can rejoice there's more to come. When the Holy Spirit enables you and and you have victory over sin and temptation, you're able to witness and see people saved, you can rejoice. That's just a down payment. There's more to come. That's what the Holy Spirit's doing in our hearts and our lives. We have this guarantee that we are completely purchased and redeemed. And it's going to be complete at the resurrection when Jesus comes for us. And we're given those glorified bodies. Amen. That's when our redemption will be complete. Well, I don't want to embarrass folks in this room, but there's a new engaged couple in our church. I know we're rejoicing with Abraham and Sharifa. And I know there's another engaged couple, Kathleen and, and Jonathan, we're praying for them as well. And, you know, when couples are engaged, the tradition is, right, the, uh, the man will buy an engagement ring for his bride-to-be. And that engagement ring is, in a sense, a pledge for a guaranteed future. That, hey, this is as good as done, right? The deal is pretty much done. It's just the timing And we have this destiny that's going to be prepared for us forever, and we're pledging that. That's the idea of an engagement ring, and in a sense, that's what the Holy Spirit does. It's this pledge of uh, this forever union that we have with the Lord that can never be undone, never be broken. And the Bible does tell us that we as Christians, we're the bride of Christ. And the bridegroom is coming for us again. Someday, very, very soon, I believe, he's coming again for us. What a day that will be. And so may may we as Christians make sure that we're ready. First of all, make sure you're saved. Make sure you've been born again, that you have the Holy Spirit, that you have been sealed. Make sure that you're trusting in Christ alone for your salvation. And then if you are saved, does it matter to you that you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit? Maybe you've never thought about it before. Or does it matter to you? Does it encourage you to maybe live like it? Live like you belong to the Lord. Live like he accepts you and approves of you. Live live like uh, you're the real deal Christian. Live that way. Live as if God has given you the authority of the Holy Spirit to go and serve him and preach the gospel. Oh, as Christians, may we rise to the occasion. May we not live just a cheap, sloppy, low-level Christian life. May we live up to all of the wonderful and glorious promises of God, including the reality that we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word and what it teaches us. And Lord, what a glorious doctrine that the Holy Spirit has this ministry in sealing us forever, a bond that can never be broken, a seal that can never be undone, Lord, you've pledged yourself to us, and what a glorious truth that that is, that we have this inheritance that we know is ours because we're in Christ. Lord, help us not to take that for granted. Help us to live in light of these precious realities. Lord, I pray we want to serve you more, be faithful to you more, be obedient to you more. Lord, all the sacrifices, quote-unquote, that we make in this world, may we realize that it's nothing based on what what you've done for us. Lord, may we rejoice in the wonderful inheritance and the guarantee that you've given us. And Lord, we pray for anyone that's lost, that they would enter into these wonderful promises also. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, perhaps you're here and the Holy Spirit is convicting you that you're not saved, but you need to be. Maybe the Holy Spirit is letting you know that you need to be born again. That it's not about playing church. It's not about getting baptized or doing good works. You need to trust in Christ alone once and for all. If you're here, you say, Pastor, please pray for me. I need to be saved. If that's you, would you slip your hand up right now and I'll pray for you. Say, I need to be saved. Holy Spirit's convicting me. I want to get this settled now. Amen. I'll take that as a testimony that many here were all professing to be saved. Oh, may God help us to live like it. 
May God help us to live in the reality of the Holy Spirit's ministry in our lives. I'm going to ask our pianist to play through a hymn. And I want us to spend some time in prayer before we leave today. Let's rejoice in what the Holy Spirit has done for us. That we're sealed. That we're protected. That we are identified with the Lord now. We're accepted in the Beloved. And we have this guarantee, this promise of a wonderful inheritance that there's more to come. Lord, may we ask the Lord to help us to go forward living a life of obedience, serving Him. You don't have to pray for the sealing of the Holy Spirit. He does that for you automatically. But the Bible does tell us we can pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let's ask and let's yield ourselves for his total control. Thank you so much for your promises to us. Thank you for what your word teaches us. Lord, I pray that uh, as we just did our best to explain this glorious doctrine, that you would help it to ring true in our heart each and every day, that we would live in light of all that you've accomplished for us. And I pray we would also have a heart to reach others so that they may enter into these wonderful promises. Lord, help us to be filled with your spirit that we may preach the gospel wherever we go and see sinners converted. Lord, continue to minister and work in all of our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together. And before we leave, let's sing our, uh, one of our favorite choruses we often sing here, number 168. Let's sing, Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. We'll sing that chorus together before we depart today. Spirit of the Living God. you to come back tonight 6 30 p.m we'll be having the lord's supper so come back and join us for that uh, let's close with a word of prayer at this time lord we rejoice in the opportunity to be in your house again this, this morning thank you for speaking and ministering to our hearts and we pray that you would help us whatever decisions that were made that by your spirit's power you would enable us to keep them and may we not just be hearers today but doers also bless us now as we depart bring us back again for tonight's meeting we pray in jesus name amen Thank you.